I'm another Kevin, I'm just a private citizen. Uh, two quick questions. First, we just touched on briefly then. Does anyone on the panel believe that foreign aid should be contingent upon developing countries getting their houses in order in terms of adopting good governance practices, cracking down on corruption, embracing transparency and accountability? And uh, secondly, on the question of gender equity and gender issues generally, can we insist on a universal human rights standard in that area or do we have to bow to cultural sensitivities? Okay, thank you. Um, Jenna, would you like to have a go there? <laughs> I've been talking too much, so. <laughs> well, if, if, if Kevin won't respond, <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps I could just make some comments. I think that uh, um, this is something that we as a government and the previous government um, and now the opposition were very mindful of and it goes back to this fundamental issue about what is effective aid. So trying to link our, our aid efforts and to improve our, target our aid efforts has been um, top, a top of mind priority. So some of the initiatives that uh, have re recently um, put in place include, for example, the Pacific Partnerships for Development, which is really about the Pacific Island countries actually focusing on improved governance, um, um, certainly trying to eliminate corruption, understanding the military regimes and the um, poor processes that already that, that are happening, and trying to do what we can as a government, not just in sending aid dollars, but also in, in sending our expertise. So we have a constant program, for example, with our Pacific um, neighbours, which is around, which focuses on improved public administration. So sending some of our leading public servants to improve governance processes within those countries to build capacity for better decision making and improved um, improved aid delivery. And we, we try, I mean, we have been unashamedly linking those to a commitment to the Millennium Development Goals. Some of our work has been deliberately focused on um, getting countries that have been lagging in their commitment to actually ramp up their efforts. And uh, so that issue about contingency um, or contingent funding, I think, is one that has been quite um, specifically part of our thinking. Um, the second point that I wanted to talk about was th the issue about um, the Cairns Compact on Strengthening Development Coordination and really the work that uh, has been going on led through the department and uh, our international aid agencies around the issue of um, um, improving our trade effort, our aid effort, our health effort, um, our investment strategies, working with companies around the, around the globe who are actually trying to um, improve their own position in those countries and, in, and by doing so improve the economic situation in those countries. So we do have to be mindful that governments as a whole have some part to play. Um, how we can actually, we do all need to be, ish, going to your question about cultural sensitivities, I think that is a really vexed issue, that uh, it's a conundrum for us all. Um, it certainly is part of the real challenge that we have in um, dealing with gender inequity. So um, these are the challenges for us and it's not, it is not the purview of the Australian government but we can provide leadership and we can provide coordination and these, it's a very strategic approach that we want to take and improve the value and effectiveness of our aid dollar. Um, jo, did you want to make some points about that? I was interested in that question which I've wrestled with a lot about whether about giving development aid assistance to um, nations where it's most required by the people but where the administration is so corrupt that you really um, in all conscience can't provide money and, and you I guess I, I keep looking and I, I've seen two layers of this um, the really extreme end I guess is a place like um, Democratic Republic of Congo uh, where you look at the, you know, this enormous level of need uh, at the community level and this hideous crisis that has claimed more people than World War II over all these years, 
but then you look at the um, malignancy of the administration there and you think there is no way in conscience that you could be pump pumping money into that system. Uh, in the end, you have to find other mechanisms to get to people um, who require assistance. Um, but at the same time, you see uh, other countries that are not quite so pesky in their um, uh, demands about uh, human rights in attaching that to any aid. And, and they're a particular country like Congo that's got massive resources. They're quite quick to jump in there and offer all sorts of um, um, development aid, resources, deals. Uh, and, um, and you see that money disappear and there's no, no, no obvious benefit to any of the people on the ground. So I've found, then, then there's another level up from that which I've increasingly begun to begin to wonder about where you've got more functional looking countries where you do have great impoverishment. There may be some questions about corruption but they're not perhaps as explicit and they don't appear to be quite as malignant from the outside. But when you go in there and you invest in good conscience in <coughs> education systems and health systems, uh, through churches, through NGOs, um, are you kind of taking the pressure off those administrations to look after their own people and are you perhaps making it easier for them to pocket money? Um, are you quelling the kind of grassroots resistance that might make them more answerable for their, uh, for their actions? So I don't have an answer to the question that the man asked but I keep, um, it's something I think that we should be debating that nuance much more vigorously in our media, much more um, openly in our discussions in, in um, parliamentary debates. And, uh, and this is the kind of nuance and, and complexity that gets so lost in, in these discussions. Mm -hmm.